uh, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending our class on uh, oaks in El Dorado County, presented by the UC Master Gardeners of El Dorado County. Our mission is to uh, extend uh, research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices in our community. This class uh, focuses on El Dorado County, but nearly uh, nearby counties uh, will find it relevant. Other county residents are encouraged to contact their Master Gardener office. Today's class is being presented by UC Master Gardener Deborah Nichols, and I am your host, Valerie Adams. This presentation uh, will be about an hour and a half long. We appreciate and encourage questions, and we'll do our best to address them all at the end of the presentation through chat. Since uh, we have quite a number of participants today, uh, we've muted everybody and turned off video except for the presenter. And uh, one last reminder, to help improve our program, we will be sending you a survey via email after the class. We appreciate uh, you completing that survey for us. Okay, then uh, let's get going. And uh, Deborah, I'll turn the class over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am your presenter today, Deborah Nichols. I have been a master gardener for since 2012, and I am also a certified California naturalist. Um, and I am the webmaster for the El Dorado chapter of the um, California Native Plant Society. And I am also a El Dorado County native, and I won't even tell you how many years I have been an El Dorado County native. So um, thank you for joining. Um, I hope I can educate all of you about oaks in general, the oaks in this county and Amador County. And I see we had quite a few people who were, were from um, Northern California in general. So most of the oaks I'll talk about, they are also found in other counties, but not all oaks are in all counties. So first of all, we're gonna talk about why we should love oaks and how significant they are to our landscape. They add great natural beauty to your property and to the landscape in general. And if you have oaks on your property, they can add up to 9% value to your property. Um, they provide very useful shade, so they can help you save a little energy in the summertime if you have oak shading in your house. They are iconic emblems of our state. And I wanted to share this photo of a giant old valley oak. It's close to 300 years old. This is down in Indian Grinding Rock State Park in Amador County. Um, in addition, oaks are tough, hardy, drought tolerant, adapted to our climate and disease resistant. And this is more important as time passes. Once again, we're in a drought this year. So it's important that we preserve these trees that are adapted to deal with the funky um, dry weather we're having and will probably get worse. They are also keystones of our natural environment and support a myriad of creatures, great and small. And I wanted this photo is of an oak that had been broken down um, by a windstorm and was cut down and about 10 years ago, and it is still trying to grow. Um, the deer hammer it frequently for the leaves, but it's hanging in there. So oak woodlands provide extremely important wildlife habitat and have higher levels of biodiversity than virtually any other terrestrial ecosystem in California. There are at least 300 terrestrial vertebrate species, 1180 vascular plant species, 370 fungal species, and estimated 5,000 arthropod species associated with the California oak woodlands. So they're vital to the natural environment in California. They are members of the beech family. There are plus or minus 600 species worldwide they exist in the tropics and the temperate zones, and it makes them one of the most common species of flowering plant. There are at least 18 to 22 species in the state with many additional subspecies and named hybrids. And these numbers actually vary as more and more DNA studies are done. Um, if you're a botanist, it's 
can be kind of frustrating trying to keep up with all the changes due to DNA studies. Um, in El Dorado County, we have six trees, three shrub species, some subspecies, and one known hybrid. Uh, Amador County has less, primarily because it's a smaller county and it doesn't have quite the elevation uh, differences that we have. So the characteristics of an oak is that they always have the dangling male catkins that release pollen in the wind. And you can see one here to your right, um, or a bunch of catkins. And they always have a tiny female flower that has three stigma. So the stigma in the bottom photo with the little pink flower um, are these little three fleshy colored things. And they're very hard to locate on a tree. Normally, you're just going to no notice the catkins. And they all have acorns. So, and the acorns are in a scale covered cup. And this just is three of the local ones, but every acorn is unique to every tree. And there are some really interesting ones out there. And acorns are tempting packages of carbs. They have 20 to 30% fat and they are six to 8% protein. They were a favored food of Native Americans and are eagerly feasted upon by animals ranging from deer to wood rats to wild turkey and all types of insects. And some of these creatures are vital in helping distribute the nuts and planting them. This is a picture of a scrub jay with an acorn in his mouth. They are a keystone species in oak woodlands and they are vital in the life cycle of the oak because they bury acorns to have food in the winter, but they forget about two thirds of them. They, they don't remember where they planted them. And so they grow as the rains come. And if you're like me, they pop up all over in your lawn. Most other animals just eat the acorn as they lay um, on the ground, except for acorn woodpeckers. And they are uh, local, certainly to El Dorado County and Amador County. And I think they're all up throughout much of California. Um, so here is one of the woodpeckers. They are, they dig holes in dead trees or fence posts or power poles, and they insert an acorn for the future. And um, acorn woodpeckers are communal birds. They live in large family groups. And so everybody has access to these acorns in the family. And this big pile of acorns on the right-hand side, these were all stored by the woodpeckers in a dying tree on my property, or actually it was pretty dead. And the bark was loose and they would stick it in a hole they had drilled and it would not stay put. It would just drop down until it was all stacked up. So there were thousands of acorns when that tree collapsed. So everybody's heard of the term masting, I'm sure. Uh, mast is an old English word for meat. It refers to a tree's crop, any tree's crop. Um, oak trees can produce up to 10,000 acorns. Um, a valley oak can produce up to 500 acorns, pounds of acorns in a year. Uh, but acorns, uh, oaks are alternate year producers. Some acorns take two years to mature. Different oaks pollinate at different times and can be adversely affected by wet weather when pollinating. And so the mass cycles vary greatly and are hard to predict. Good mass years occur every two to six years. Um, some trees are never productive and some are always very productive. And like other fruit trees or trees that have nuts, they have, uh, and I should have included this here. They have years when they produce a lot and then the next year they won't produce as much. So masting um, as such, it could be that all the trees, all the blue oaks on your property are producing all at once. So they are masting, but probably the other oak trees aren't going to producing excessively at the same time. So oaks are divided further, divided into uh, subgenera or lineages. So in this area, we have the white oak lineage, which includes valley, blue, Oregon, scrub, and leather oaks. There is also the red black lineage, and this includes black and interior live oaks. 
And then we have the intermediate, which is a canyon oak and the huckleberry oak. And why this matters? Um, because oaks do hybridize, but only within a subgenus. So for instance, in this area, we have hybrids from live oaks and black oaks. And the black oaks aren't gonna make a hybrid with a blue oak because they're a different subgenus. But live oaks are the same subgenus. Galls are unique to species or subgenus. So if you get into galls like I sort of am, uh, it can help you identify what the galls are because they only grow on certain trees or in certain subgenus trees. Uh, acorns and white oak subgenus ripen in one year and acorns in red, black and intermediate subgenus ripen in two years. So you will see ripe acorns, but then there'll be a little tiny for next year acorns on the same tree. Um, and diseases may affect one subgenus more than another. So in El Dorado County and Amador County, we have five main tree oaks, though there is one other that I'll talk about. We have valley oaks, black oaks, interior live oaks, blue oaks, and canyon oaks. Um, there are other possible species and hybrids in the area, but these are the major ones. So the first is the Quercus lobata, and Quercus is a species name, the valley oak. And here is a huge old, this is my mother's neighborhood, and there are a whole bunch of trees like this in that neighborhood, a huge old valley oak that is completely shading the tree beneath. Um, they're big, they're, they um, have a lot of wood in them. They have huge horizontal limbs and spreading crowns. And they prefer moist bottomlands or riparian habitats. So you won't find them usually on dry slopes or in rocky areas. And they do grow up to 6,500 foot elevation in ideal conditions. So the leaves are two to four inches with blunt lobes, matte green above, pale green below with felt like hair. And the acorns are con conical shaped in warty cap. And the acorns are fairly long. And I think of them as being like long, elegant lady fingers when I see them. The bark is thick and grooved and nearly corky looking and pewter in color. Now this is on mature oaks. All the bark always changes as oaks get older, their bark changes. This one is one of those old valley oaks from Indian grinding rock and woodpeckers have been drilling holes in them, but for some reason they haven't stored any acorns in them. Um, and they are deciduous members of the white oak subgenus. Now, Quercus douglasii is the blue oak. And this is in the fall, so it is deciduous oak and it is turning color uh, in prior to losing its leaves. It's a moderate sized tree that can have a spreading crown or it can be more upright. Does not get as big as the valley oak. Nothing gets as big as the valley oak. Um, it goes dormant. It can go dormant during the summer. So if you have blue oaks and they lose their leaves in August when it's really, really hot and dry, do not be alarmed. They will probably be fine come the following fall. It's just a conservation mes uh, measure so they don't have to use water that's not there. They grow up to 3,500 foot elevation in shallow soils. So they can handle a tougher environment. The leaves are one to three inches long. They're wavy or shallowly lobed as you can see these are. And they are most blue in the early fall. Now I just took this picture. Um, so they're already pretty blue. They start out being very green. And then as they mature, they stiffen and get a layer of kind of a waxy layer on them and they turn blue. And the acorns are tapered in shallow warty cups. The bark is light gray or whitish in very uh, narrow shallow strips. So they don't get the big porky bark. And they are also a member of the white oak subgenus. And then there's Quercus 
Gariana. Now this one is not what I would consider one of the big five in the innate uh, area, but they do grow in El Dorado County and I'm assuming in Amador County. They are a mo moderate sized tree in this area with upright limbs and spreading crowns. They are not that common here. They grow up to 1,000 to 4,000 feet in rocky, gravelly, or heavy clay. So once again, they're oaks that grow in bad soil or what we would consider bad soil. The acorns are the most distinctive part. Um, if I go back here and you can look, this chubby, it's the only word I've got for it, almost a round acorn. Um, this is the only oak tree species in the county that has an acorn like this. So they're large and round and they have small cups with scale. The leaves are four to six inches and they're broad lobes, smooth and spineless. They are shiny dark green on top and lighter underneath and downy. The bark is thin, white to grayish, finely fissured, and they are deciduous members of the white oak subgenus. And then sh shrubs in this white oak subgenus, we have the Quercus dorata, which means leather oak or is leather oak. Uh, it grows below 6,000 feet in serpentine soil only. So a good place to see these is uh, Traverse Creek area up near Georgetown. They don't grow in Amador County, or at least they haven't been reported there. The leaves are less than one inch and they are convex. So they curl under, they're oval, they'll, they're dull green, as you can see, with pale green underside and the acorn cup cap that you see there is actually rather large in comparison to the leaf size. And then another um, scrub oak in the area, um, this one grows near Cameron Park Rescue Area as Quercus berberidia folia, inland scrub oak. It's below 5,000 feet in foothills and upland slopes. The leaves are very small. They're less than one inch. They're variable in shape and margins, but they always have a rounded tip on them. So they don't really have a tip at all, I guess you'd say. Um, and I've got it compared here to a uh, measuring thing. So you can see that each leaf is about one inch or maybe even a little less in size. So Quercus, Kilagii um, is the black oak. And here we have a black oak in the fall because they are deciduous and they turn color, beautiful russet color, and then lose their leaves. They're a tall tree with ascending limbs and they have open rounding crown. Um, they grow up, to, they don't really start growing until around 2000 feet. So you might find some in rescue, but really they're more likely to start in the Placerville area. Um, and they grow up to 6,000 feet elevation. So you do see them up in the mountains. And they are deciduous members of the black red subgenus. The acorns are oblong in a deep shaggy cup and it's the cup that's most distinguishable. It kind of looks like a old fashioned beetle's haircut. Um, the leaves are, can be really big, up to six inches. They have deep angular lobes. And I'm going to be showing some pictures of leaves and acorns further on here to help you get this all straight in your head. Um, so they have angular lobes with a bristle, which is unique, a bristle at the tip of each lobe. And they are a shiny green. And the bark is smooth and gray in youth. And then it becomes blackish and deeply fissured as it ages. And then we have Quercus wislensia. CI, um, anterior live oak. And this is one most people are familiar with and they recognize it when they see it, mainly because it has generally multiple trunks. They're typically broader than they are tall. Um, the multiple trunks um, are actually, is not necessarily the only way they grow. They can grow with a single trunk, but because the deer love them so much when they're first growing, um, every time the deer eats it down, it doesn't kill the tree. It just prompts it to send up more branches. And eventually the branches that survive become the trunks. So um, they grow below 5,000 feet from the floodplains to the slopes. And the leaves 
tend to be thick, leathery, deep green above, yellowish green below, and they can be very variable. They can be smooth, toothed, or spiny. The acorn is, in, is narrow, sitting deep in a scaled cup. Bark smooth and gray when young and becomes dark and fissured as it ages. And they are an evergreen tree and they are members of black red subgenus. So speaking of the black red subgenus and hybridization as I was earlier, we have Quercus ex morhus, which is the oracle oak, and they're pretty common in El Dorado County. I don't know about Amador County. So anywhere where you have black and interior live oaks together, you may end up with oracle oaks. They are variable. I can't tell you exactly what they look like because they vary um, from tree to tree. Some may be partially deciduous, some may be completely deciduous. The leaves may change color in the fall. They may not. Um, one I look for is usually they have bristles at the tips and serrated or lobed edges, but not as deeply lobed as a black oak tree. So Quercus chrysolepis is the canyon oak. And they are a medium-sized tree found in all soils with variable habit habitat and variable form. Um, they grow up to 9,000 feet in elevation. So you can see these high up in the mountains. And as you can see, they're a little unique in that back of the leaves, especially in the fall, normally they're kind of grayish, but in the fall they get this golden hair on them. So they're very distinctive in that. And then the acorns, as you can see, the cups are also gold, um, somewhat hairy. And they have generally pretty large acorns, but the most distinctive thing is the cup. So acorns grow up to two inches long and they have the fine gold hairs. The leaves are up to two and a half inches with shiny dark green above. And then the underside, as I said, was grayish with gold hairs in the fall. The bark is gray or whitish in smooth, shallow strips and they are evergreen trees in the intermediate subgenus. And then we have Quercus vaccinifolia, which is a huckleberry oak. And this is a high altitude shrub oak, it grows in mountains up to 10,000 feet. Uh, in this county, you won't find it below 5,000 feet. So this photo, Ignore the trees in the background because what counts is this coating, kind of a fur that coats the slopes and those are all huckleberry oaks. So you find them in rocky, steep areas and areas that are less steep. Um, you know, the only oak like that that you're gonna find up at that altitude. Um, so that's about all to say about those. So now that I've confused you with all the possible oak species in the area, um, it is a challenge to identify oaks. First of all, they don't read the books. Just because I say they may prefer this or that doesn't mean that they won't decide to grow outside of their habitat occasionally. Um, and they are very adaptive to their environment, which means their appearance may vary uh, with the amount of heat or light or predation that they get, and yes, animals do eat the leaves, especially when they're young. Um, and they change as they age. The leaves change shape when, for the deciduous oaks, when they first put out leaves, they may be soft and green, very pliable. And you're going, well, what tree is this? And then three months later, all of a sudden, they've changed color. They're usually stiffer. They frequently acquire a waxy coating on them. Um, and the bark, usually, almost always, I would say, if you see a small oak with really, really rough bark, it's probably, you know, shaggy and everything, it's probably one of the scrub oaks. Otherwise, might be diseased, but normally it's a scrub oak because most small, young tree oaks have smooth gray bark, which as they age, it becomes rougher and it gets furrowed or very corky looking and to confuse matter more, oaks hybridize. 
So what kind of oaks do you have on your property? And I'm only talking about natives. And I say separate those because there are oaks that are sold in nurseries that are not from California. And one that is frequently sold would be Quercus rubra, which is from the East Coast. And it's the red oak because it has beautiful color in the fall. But anyway, for native oaks, is it an evergreen tree? So does it lose its leaves in the winter? If it does, and it's not a shrub, well, if it does not, and it's not a shrub, does it have, you only have two choices. It's either gonna be a canyon oak or an interior live oak. So on your left are those very distinctive acorns. So for oak identification, fall is the best time to do this because usually you're gonna go by acorns, not always, but usually. So in the fall, canyon oaks get these beautiful acorns with these beautiful gold fur, furry look to them. And on the right, you have the interior live oak, which is your only other option for an evergreen oak tree in this area. Um, so you can see that the acorns are longer and narrower and the leaves are shaped differently also, but that's not as relevant, but they don't. You can see the back of one of the interior live oak and it does not have that golden fuzz on it. So does it have leaves that it loses in winter? So is it deciduous? In that case, it can be a valley oak, a black oak, a blue oak, or less likely, because they're rarer in this area, an Oregon oak. Um, if the leaves are extremely large with angular lobing and bristles, then it's a black oak. And I have a picture here of black oaks and a valley oak um, leaves. So the one on the left is the black oak and you can just see it has angles. And it's kind of hard to see from this picture, but at the tip of each of one of those points is a bristle. So if the leaves are smaller with curvy lobes and no bristles, it's probably a valley oak. Not 100%, but most likely. So that's a valley oak on the right. If the leaves are less than two inches and wavy and acquiring a blue tint as they mature, it's a blue oak. And if it has really chubby acorns, then it's going to be the Oregon oak. And the leaves look somewhat like a valley oak, though they're not as deeply lobed. Um, so I would definitely go with the acorns on this one because a valley oak has long, thin, thinnish acorns, whereas the Oregon oak has the chubby oak. So I'm not gonna leave you in the lurch here and further on, we're gonna go to a few websites where I show you how you can get help in identifying oaks. Um, but one of my favorite books is Oaks of California by Bruce M. Pavlik and company. Um, has a nice write up on each oak and useful keys for identifying them, plus pictures of various leaves and acorns, and much more information. And then there's the Laws Field Guide to C Sierra Nevada County, or to S the Sierra Nevada by John Muir Laws. And no, I do not get any money for recommending this book. Um, if you're new to the foothills and the mountains, and it looked in the survey like about 30% of you are new up into this area, um, I recommend this book for everything because it has everything from spiders to birds to trees to mammals, animal scat, um, flowers, bats, just about everything you might want to know that lives in the Sierra Nevada. So uh, one question we get asked as master gardeners is, my neighbor's cutting down the tree, his oak tree, can he do that? Or I want to cut down an oak tree, can I do that? Um, there is an El Dorado County Oak Ordinance was adapted in 2017 as part of the general plan with the intention of preserving our uh, native oak trees. It is more stringent than the California state law in that you must pay to mitigate if removing oaks from your property unless they are hazard trees. So if it's got a big old limb or the whole tree is looming over your house and you've been assured that it's rotten and it's gonna collapse anytime you can take it out. 
But otherwise, it, your best practice is to contact the county before removal of the oak tree. And no, it doesn't prevent you from removing the oaks. You just, the bigger the oak tree is, the more you have to pay to remove it. Because you pay by inches around, I think it is. And then the bigger the tree is, there's also like extra fees attached to that. So now it's time to discuss some of the problems you might encounter with your oaks. Um, there are two dam agents of damage to any plant. Um, there's biotic damage, which is caused by pathogens, pests, animals, parasites, and other living things. And there are the abiotic agents of damage, which are caused by adverse environmental conditions or poor cultural practices. And humans can make changes. Humans are biotic, but they make changes to the environment that cause abiotic damage to oaks. So the problems with oaks is us. We have met the enemy and he is us. 30% of the oaks have been eliminated in this state, mainly through development and agriculture. But of course there are some biotic problems. They are subject to disease and pest infestation like any other plant. Um, one common one that we've gotten a number of phone calls in, especially in very wet springs is powdery mildew. It's most obvious on blue oaks. It generally is caused by too much rain late in the spring. Um, it turns a blue oak kind of a pale blue or grayish or almost white. There's nothing that you can do and there's nothing that needs to be done. If it's severe, the trees may lose most of their leaves, but they will mo most likely grow them back by the following spring. Another problem is armillaria root rot or oak root fungus. If you can, so it is favored by warm, wet soils. So it can affect oaks that are growing in lawns, for instance. It may, you may actually see mushrooms growing at the base, like in this photo. Um, though there may also just be a lot of mycelia growing under the bark and the tree is not thriving. There's really no reasonable treatment. It may or may not kill the tree. Um, so I'll say this right now with regards to any problem that oak tree is having. There's a saying, and I've heard it in various ways, but we'll go with this one, that it takes 300 years for an oak tree to grow and 300 years for it to die. Just because it is having some sort of a health issue, as it were, um, doesn't mean it's gonna die tomorrow. It might not die for another 50 to 100 years. Now, if it's a threat to your home or your car or, or something, then it probably needs to be taken care of. And by that, I mean either dangerous limbs removed or the tree itself removed. So another condition is Phytopathera root and crown rot. Now this is promoted by excess soil moisture and poor drainage. So once again, if you, for instance, have an oak tree in a lawn, um, may be problematic for it. The leaves discolor, they stunt, they wilt, or they drop prematurely. And the roots, if you dig it up, are dark and decayed. So the tree may die from this. Um, when you could try draining the standing water if it is in water. Another condition is anthracnose. This can cause severe defoliation of the new growth during wet spring weather. And these are just pictures of some, uh, I think they're live oak leaves that are uh, affected by it. And another condition that we do not have in this county, but I wanna bring it up so you're aware of it in case anybody suggests that that's what your tree has, probably does not. Um, it only occurs 50 miles from the coast so far, and that is sudden oak death. It affects primarily coast live oaks. It has not moved into inland, and it's partly because of the degree of moisture that's encountered on the coast. But it is a good idea not to accept any oak firewood from the coast. So one condition that is fairly... Um, very obvious and a little alarming when you see it on a tree is foamy canker, which is otherwise known as alcoholic flux. 
Um, it's a white frothy material that oozes from wounds in the tree and it smells like alcohol. There's no real treatment necessary. It's a bacterial infection that gets into the tree. For instance, if you were pounding nails into it or a string trimmer hit it or something like that. It should not be fatal to the tree though. Now, something that can be very fatal is foamy bark canker. This is a fungal disease spread by Western oak bark beetles. It's new in this area on interior live oaks. Um, a pink to white frothy foam oozes from the bark and it may, you may also get a reddish sap that oozes from insect holes. And in this picture, you can see, especially at the top of this little bit of white, that is an insect hole. So the, the beetle burrows in, which is not really particularly harmful, but they have this fungal disease that then spreads through the tree. Um, it can be fatal to the tree and most likely will be, and it can be contagious. So um, once again, if you, if you were to cut down a tree that has this kind, don't transport the wood. Um, if you cut down this tree as firewood, burn it, you can burn it in your fireplace, but don't uh, transport it. The best thing, because this is fairly new and we, I think we're kind of keeping track of this, contact master gardeners or a certified arborist if you think you have this on one of your live oak trees. So I'm gonna talk about fungal, fungus on oak trees right now. A visible sign of a fungus on a tree could mean that the wood is filled with mycelium, but once again, it doesn't necessarily mean the tree is gonna to die tomorrow. Uh, the fungus itself does not kill the tree, but the damage that is done to the wood can cause structural failure. So, um, and that's why I, sometimes you'll see oak trees that have collapsed or been cut down and they have hollows in them. And it's partly because of fungus that have gotten inside of the trees. Um, there is little that can be done for a tree that is displaying fungus. And it may take decades for it to actually kill the tree if it ever does. So another condition that you may have heard of and every year it seems there's one or two news stories about this is, um, and not just oak trees, but many trees, um, limb drop, summer branch drop, or sudden limb failure. Um, it's a summer phenomenon that often occurs on hot, calm days. The branches break off, um, and they're usually horizontal branches. They're three to 12 inches from a trunk, or feet from a trunk. And the limbs may be sound when they break off. There may be absolutely nothing wrong with the limbs or the point where they're attached to the tree. The mechanism that causes this is not fully understood, uh, though it's pretty positive since this occurs in the summer that drought stress may induce it, but they're not sure of the mechanism yet as to how that occurs. So to deal with it, Avoid improperly pruning a tree that could create an overgrowth of new wood and leaves on the limb. So first thing any tree is going to do or any shrub uh, also, you cut off a branch. It's going to try to regenerate itself there because it needs, it you know, lives through photosynthesis, which is done by the leaves mainly, especially in oak trees. And so it's going to miss some nutrients when you're cutting it up. So it's going to put a new flush of growth and that could overweight a limb. So be careful with that. Um, large horizontal limbs should be removed if they are in a dangerous location, such as over a house or a walkway or driveway. And that's, you know, up to you. It's a liability issue, of course, um, or can be. But if you're convinced that it's a very strong limb, then it, like I said, it's up to you. So another condition that oak trees are prone to, and everybody's familiar with this, is mistletoe. Mistletoes are native plants. They're not invasive. They are only partially parasitic. Um, what they do is put roots into the branches to obtain water. They actually photosynthesize their own food. Um, mistletoe should not kill a healthy tree, but it can be pruned out. Um, though it will regrow. There are sprays for it, but it has to be repeated. And of course you're spraying some kind of herbicide around in the air, which is not necessarily a good idea. 
Uh, and mistletoe does provide habitat and food for a variety of animals and insects. And I found out recently that bluebirds like mistletoe berries. So, and deer, if you cut the mistletoe and just leave it lying, if you have deer in your yard or whatever, they'll come eat it. They, they love it for some reason. So now we'll talk about insects that oak trees are prone to. There are a variety, like 5,000 of them, of borers, beetles, caterpillars, worms, mites, aphids, scale, and leaf hoppers that can infest all parts of an oak, um, from the leaves to the acorns. They will generally not kill a healthy tree. And the treatment is usually not warranted considering the expense and risk associated with large scale spraying. So one thing you might see, I could not find the actual caterpillar, but I could find a picture of the moth, is the fruit tree leaf roller. It rolls up young leaves and ties them in silk and it causes leaf distortion. Um, and the caterpillar larvae hang down on a silken thread. They can completely defoliate a tree. Um, that can be a problem if the tree is otherwise stressed. And I'll talk about stressors for oak trees further on, but it's generally not gonna hurt the tree. Another one is tent caterpillars. And there are several species that affect many types of trees. And we've gotten phone calls on these into master gardeners. Uh, they make silken tents or mats that they rest in when molting and there'll be dozens or hundreds of caterpillars in these mats. And it's unsightly and messy, there's no doubt about it, but it will not generally kill a tree. Um, though you can see in this picture that they've defoliated some of the branches. Another is the California oakworm and oak moth and they can defoliate a tree, but will generally not kill it. So most of these are caterpillars that turn into moths and everybody's, many people I'm sure have experienced, you know, walking through an area where there's a lot of oak trees and there's, you're walking into worms or actually they're caterpillars as you walk along. So it's one of these that has kind of become kind of epidemic at that point, you know, but it's not anything to worry about on your trees. It's not pleasant. Um, it's kind of messy, but it's not a hazard to the tree. So I'm going to talk about oak galls. This is a favorite subject of mine. Um, oak galls are an overgrowth, or galls of any kind, because most plants are prone to some sort of galls, are an overgrowth of plant tissue. Uh, in this case, it is produced in response to chemicals secreted, secreted by gall wasp larvae, which are usually from the sinipid family. Now, this picture is not of a sinipid wasp. It's another uh, gall-forming wasp. The gall wasp larvae are no bigger than one inch, eighth inch in size and the wasps are very tiny and don't have stings and you probably will never see one in your life. Um, each wasp lays its eggs on only one species of tree or on only trees in one subgenus. So this is a gall that most people have seen in your blue oaks or your valley oaks. Um, it's called an acorn or an apple gall oak apple gall and they do start out green and then they turn brown as the season progresses. Um, they come, the galls come in a wonderful variety of shapes, sizes and colors. Each is unique to each wasp species and oak gall wasps have two generations each year. One is a sexual generation and one reproduces asexually and each generation produces a different gall. So you can see that you have almost an infinite variety of galls that you might see in a tree. Um, each gall may contain several insects, including uh, the wasp larvae, parasitic larvae that are eating the gall uh, wasp larvae, and others who are feeding on the gall itself and using it for protection. So here's a photo I took of the gall Andricus gigas. Um, it looks like little Mexican hats to me and that's on a blue oak leaf. And here is a, I believe it's an urchin gall on another blue oak leaf. Um, so it's a little orange or pinkish, I guess you'd call that thing in there with all kinds of little knobs on it. 
So as in conclusion with regards to insects, remember that all insects are potential food for hungry wildlife. Um, birds primarily feed their young, except for, you know, raptors or pigeons and doves, feed their young worms. And they can feed upwards of 4,500 worms per baby per year. So they're vital to birds in raising their young. And each insect is a part of the web of life. I, one could argue that if you have an oak tree that has all sorts of bugs on it, it's actually a very healthy environment. Um, native non-beneficial insects are usually balanced by beneficial insects. And if you get a little jiggy with the sprays that you just have to get out there and poison something, you're probably going to poison non -benef or beneficial insects as well as non-beneficial ones. Um, and pesticides, as I've said, can harm beneficial insects. And herbicides, well, I'll, I'll address the herbicides further on. But anyway, that's what I have to say about insects. I don't view them as a problem in any tree unless it's a fruit tree and I'm trying to harvest apples or something. So for identification of insects and diseases, here's a few I highly recommend the Pest of Landscape Trees and Shrubs from UCANR that you can purchase from us online. Um, it has a wonderful troubleshooting section in the back. It goes by species and then you look at the symptoms and then you go to a section that discusses how to control the disease. And a wonderful source if you're super interested in oaks in particular is the USDA Field Guide to Insects and Diseases of California Oaks, and that is online. So, as I said earlier, we have met the enemy and he is us. Humans cause the vast majority of damage to oaks. Um, the building of homes, driveways, sidewalks, and roads result in compaction of soil which uh, physically damages tree roots and starves them of water and nutrients. And uh, lawns around oak trees can lead to, to diseases caused by too much water impacting the trunk or the shallow roots of the oak. Planting in the root zone can cause mechanical damage to the roots and watering new plants because they do need to be watered for a year to two years can lead to diseases. If you must plant, select small, drought tolerant plants, preferably native, and plant far away, at least six feet away from the trunk. Overspray from herbicides can damage oaks. You may think you're just dumping that spray on a bunch of grass and small weedy shrubs underneath the oak, but that poison, if it's kind of like Roundup, that, you know, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't mention it by name, but Roundup that gets sucked into the roots, all the roots underground of all the different plants they have discovered are interconnected via my, my, mycelium, which is a fungus. And uh, so you can be transporting herbicides to your oak tree when you're trying to spray weeds. String trim trimmers damage, um, string trimmer damage can introduce pathogens as in the foamy, cank uh, foamy canker picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, and raking all the fallen oak leaves can starve the tree of nutrients. So I know that's a problem if you live in a fire prone area, which I think all of El Dorado County is considered to be fire prone. But just keep that in mind. Um, if nothing else, maybe you could leave them there until the following spring or something. But whatever's going on with your oak, don't panic. Oaks are tough. This photo, which doesn't show up as clearly as I would like to, is of a black oak that broke off or got blasted off. It's got a great big hole through the center of it. You could stick your head through it probably. And it has come back to life. I've lived out here 12 years and it was nothing but a stump. And now it's becoming a tree again. There are not many conditions that will kill oaks outright. It is best to take a wait and see attitude with most problems, unless the tree has been diagnosed with a deadly contagious disease. 
So for the care of oaks, it's mainly do nots. Don't water them. And I do say in extended drought, you may justify giving extra water in the winter, but you do not want to water them in the summer because that will cause disease. But keep in mind that oak trees evolved with California droughts. So I didn't have any oak trees die out here even during our five-year drought. They all are fine. Um, don't plant with their drip line if at all possible or plant only drought tolerant native plants. Don't rake up their leaves. They are mulch and their decay leads to the return of vital nutrients to the tree, especially minerals. Don't cover the crown by backfilling soil up to the trunk. Keep mulch away from the trunks and buttress roots. You can mulch underneath an oak tree if you're not gonna leave the uh, oak leaves, but just keep it about six feet away from the trunk and the buttress roots. Do not pile rocks on the roots or around the trunk. If you have rocks, put them someplace else, but not around your oak tree. Um, avoid damage from string trimmers because pathogens can enter the wounds and don't dig into their roots if you can avoid it. Do not fertilize around oak trees. That only introduces um, weeds and things. And they don't need the fertilizer. Do not use herbicides around the oak trees. Pruning, you can prune deciduous oaks in the winter and evergreen oaks in the summer. So you pre prune the deciduous oaks when they're dormant and the evergreen oaks tend to be dormant in the summer. Um, prune properly and avoid creating wounds or places where water can gather. So last time I taught this class, somebody wanted to know about planting acorns. So I think I can do this pretty quick. I'm sorry, I don't have lots of sexy photos for this one. I'll have to get some. Um, it's a wonderful idea. If you have a large piece of property in particular and you feel like it needs more oak trees, it probably does. Um, but consider your location. If your lot is small and shady, it might be best not to plant an oak tree because um, it could become a hazard in the future and your neighbors might not be very happy with you. Um, and also small lots, you need full sun. Their roots extend 50% beyond the edge of their canopy. So they're going to be, they're not invasive roots. They're not gonna root up your house or your sidewalk, but if the tree can't stretch its roots out enough, it's not gonna get the nutrients and water that it needs and not be very happy. Um, your neighbors might not appreciate it, as I said. And so it's best to plant on large sunny lots or if you have acreage. So if you're gonna plant acorns, you wanna harvest them as locally as you can and collect, you know, only natives. Collect the acorns when they're fresh and mature, which is in the fall when they first start dropping. Um, some people collect them from the trees, especially if they're growing hundreds of trees, but it's best uh, you can collect from the ground with the, um, Caps should separate easily. So you just want the acorn. You dump the acorns into a bucket of water and you stir them. You let it sit for a couple hours and the oaks that have sunk to the bottoms are the good ones. So um, because the floaters, that means they have holes in them caused by insects and there might not even be any nut left in it really. So you save the largest acorns for planting because that is providing the most uh, nutrition to the seedling. If you are using orc oaks, you're using acorns from valley, blue, or Oregon oaks. They can be planted immediately in the fall, or you can store them in the fridge until they're ready to plant. Um, so black or interior live oaks should be stratified or stored in a fridge for 30 to 90 days before planting. Um, Make sure you don't keep the caps with them and you throw out any slimy or moldy acorns over time. Um, don't plant them for sure. And some people, you can put them in something like perlite that sort of will keep some moisture in them. Um, so this is a picture of a live oak sapling as you can, or seedling. And as you can see what the oak sap, seedling does first or the acorn is sends down a very long tap root and eventually around March you'll see some little leaves coming up 
But here it is, May. I pulled this up just recently and it still has acorn, which is still providing nourishment to that seedling. So as I said, you sow your acorns, depending on the species in late fall or early winter, once the ground is moist, you plant them two in a hole, one to two inches down, that's to allow for failure, uh, laying them on their sides and covering them with soil. And consider, you know, it doesn't seem like very deep, but of course acorns that just fall out of trees grow and they're not planted at all. And a blue jay only pokes them down an inch or two into the soil if they're planting them. So protect them from predation. Um, you can plant them inside milk cartons with the top and the bottom cut off or purchase tree protectors. And this is a photo of a large area that's being restored. And, the, and we've all seen it in parks and things where oaks have been planted with the tree protectors around them. So mark your location though, because you won't see anything before March. Um, then protect the seedlings once they are above the ground because they are considered food by many animals. Keep a weed-free area up to four feet away from your trunk for several years. And it is most important to avoid competition because of the water issue. So mulch, and once again, don't put them up against the trunk of the little trees. Keep it away to prevent moisture loss. And you can water or not. Um, water may make the trees grow faster, but in studies that were done, even those that weren't watered do survive. They just don't grow quite as fast. So um, I'm not gonna go through this step by step, but the, well, these are all the resources that I've used and I recommend. Some of them I've already talked about. Um, one of my favorite authors is Doug Tallamy here under Bringing Nature Home. He has a new book called The Nature of Oaks. He really has a thing for oaks. And I highly recommend either book um, to kind of open your eyes about the importance of keeping a natural environment. Um, and let's see. I wanted to talk about Secrets of the Oak Woodlands, Plants and Animals Among California Oaks. This is a sweet little book by a woman named Kate Marion Child. And it would be wonderful for children you could read because it's a chapter at a time about each animal or plant that lives in an oak woodland. And I think it would be a great introduction for children into this sort of subject. So at this point, I am going to Hopefully I am sharing my internet resources. I wanted to show you a few of these. Um, if anybody uh, thinks they're not seeing them, let me know. But anyway, this is the El Dorado County website for uh, um, oak ordinance so there's information there for you and then one site I really wanted to introduce you to is calflora.org and mm -hmm. it is uh, a wonderful resource for just about everything but if you are curious about what kind of oaks are growing in your neighborhood or your um, community you can just go in and I type Quercus because there's other trees that have oak in them and other shrubs, and you'll end up with poison oak and um, tan bark oak and things like that. So you type Quercus and you can click on El Dorado County since that's what we're talking about and go to search. And that will pull up a list. Sorry guys, I'm having issues with managing all of this. All these pop-up things get in the way. Um, a list of all the oaks that have been reported in El Dorado County. And then, so if you're really interested in a particular species, say we'll do black oaks. Then you would click on that. And you have a range map, so you can see black oaks grow 
all over El Dorado County or uh, California, not just El Dorado County. And then you can even click on El Dorado County and get a more detailed picture. Now what this does, and these aren't rare enough that you're really gonna go looking for them, but there's actually a list here that shows you where they've been found in various parts in El Dorado County. So, um, anyway, that's Cal Flora. Now, the other things about Cal Flora is that um, you can see lots of pictures also, you know, in case you're just not sure what you, at, you have. So, this has a good pictures of the leaves and what the leaves look like when they're growing. Um, if you can see, hopefully my mouse, uh, what they look like as they come out in the fall. So another website that is great for all sorts of things. If you wanna learn about plants, flowers, insects, whatever, um, it says search for California native plants by name. So once again, I'm gonna type Quercus. Oops, well, it doesn't like just a name. Let's uh, back that up. Let's go into, you can do it in many ways. You could do trees. And then you can, here's black oak under here. And you could click that. It brings information up on it. Now you can also put in um, your address and it will give you a list of all the plants that you could, native plants that you could plant in that area. But here's the black oak. Once again, you're gonna get a range map. Once again, you're gonna get a whole bunch of photos. And then underneath you've got, it talks about black oaks, all the details about them. And then further down, you have information about how they grow. You have information about the wildlife that the sport. So for butterflies and moths, there's confirmed eight species, but there's 171 likely. And then you can actually click on that and see every single one of them. Um, so there's lots of information to be had there. Other area where you can get information on oak trees is UC Oaks. This is a Berkeley uh, location. And if you go into it and click on resources, which is what I've done here, then you see pictures of the various oaks and information like here we have blue oak and it talks about their height, the foliage, fire tolerance, which is becoming more important in this area. And once again, there's photos on all of that. So the final thing I wanna show, and this is for the disease section this is UCIPM, and to get to it easily, I just type in the search bar UCIPM, and you get this. And they've got some wonderful new functions here. On the right-hand side is the plant problem diagnostic tool. So you click on that. And say you have a plant type. And we're going to go with um, trees and shrubs plant names. So you've got a list now of all trees and shrubs and you go in and you pick, um, and it's a lengthy list, let me tell you. But anyway, eventually you get to Oak and you click on the, where it says add to my list and you get your plant parts. And in this case, I'm gonna say, trunk. I'm adding it to my list. And the damage. So you can use this for any plant, not just oak trees. And it has pictures of the damage that you're seeing on your oak tree. So in my case, I wanted to do the trunk spots, lesions, streaked. Or how about trunk sap oozing liquid? And then you view your results. And there's eight results. And here are pictures of the various things. In this case, they've come up with a lot of, um, well, they have a list. You've got canker diseases, various moths, 
crown rots. So these are all the things that could be wrong. And, you, and right now the bark beetles is the one that popped up. But if you were interested in canker diseases, then here are the various canker diseases and help in diagnosing it and solutions. So I think the only other thing is, and this is at the end of the, the PDF for this PowerPoint has been posted already on Master Gardener's website. And it has a list of all my resources. So this one is great. If any of you have rangeland and you're thinking of regenerating oaks, this is a 71 page document that will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about growing oak trees. So at that point, I think I'll stop my share. And Valerie, do we have some questions? Yes, Deborah, we've got a couple of questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's see. Uh, so right now we have uh, about three, but there may be some others that come up. Um, uh, so first question is, um, any ideas of how to remove poison oak growing throughout an oak tree? Yeah, poison oak's a fun thing. Um, and I really don't, I haven't researched. I mean, I, it's highly, you know, if you're allergic to it, stay away from it, number one. And maybe you can pay somebody else. If you get full gear, which means gloves, mask, goggles, long sleeves, you might be able to go out and cut it away. But one thing you don't want to do is burn the poison oak because I've heard of people getting poison oak in their wind, you know, in their throats and stuff. You don't want that. Um, so the most you could do is maybe get it out into an area where it can't do any damage and just let it rot. Um, other than that, because I don't recommend, you know, if it was growing someplace else, you might be able to use something, some glycophosphate to point, you paint the uh, uh, stubs where you cut it off, but that could actually get into the oak tree. And you can have, I've had some unexpected results doing things like that um, and killed one of my grapevines once trying to get rid of some blackberries that way. So really, that's all I had to suggest because you certainly can't burn it. If you have goats or you could hire goats or something, they would love your poison oak. So that's always an option. But that yeah, is really the only suggestion I have. So next question. I have, I, have, uh, I have some experience with that very thing uh, because I live on 10 acres in uh, the Cameron Park area. Um, and here is what I have learned. The goats, of course, goats and horses love poison oak. So there's, that's the most ecological uh, approach to it. Um, I've paid, I have a couple of friends who are not allergic to poison oak. So I've had them uh, cut it out for me. And I do that exactly. I pile it out in the middle <clears throat> of the pasture and I just let it uh, rot to the ground. Um, they say after five years, the oil has, um, uh, it, it has dispersed, but it's so risky i'm i'm not willing to uh burn it and i just let it decay um the other successful uh approach that i've had is um some kind of brush buster herbicide not uh you know not roundup because it's not engineered to kill woody uh plants like poison oak and um you know, uh, I have several uh, magnificent oaks that have uh, really thick poison oak uh, growing up into them. I mean, the vines are like two or three inches in diameter. And the success that I've had with that is to use the herbicide undiluted using a small paintbrush, painting the herbicide directly onto the four feet of that vine um, and that seems to be successful as well because I have had the experience um, early on in living here of spraying it 
and actually killing the oak that the uh, ivy was in. So um, uh, that's my experience with that. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Our, yeah, uh, um, next question is, uh, how large of a branch am I allowed to remove from an oak tree? Well, you can remove any size of a branch. It's removing the whole tree that's the issue. So um, if you just, in general, don't like it where it is or something, then is when you need to go to the county and find out if you're allowed to remove it. But removing a branch, as long as you can justify it, um, should not be an issue, I would say. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So uh, question, I have several oaks and I have to deal with uh, so many acorns sprouting. Um, often when I pull them up, the roots break. Uh, will this kill them, hopefully? Uh, if not, what's the best way uh, besides using an herbicide? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, well, I know it can be annoying, I will say that. Your best bet, I would say, is maybe if you have like a hoe or something, it's just to hoe them out and you should get some of the root. Once the tree has sent up leaves, I would think the acorn itself might be depleted. So pulling it up at that point might be okay. Um, the other possibility is to put down a little plastic or something like that on top of it, or uh, maybe some cardboard. Um, I really don't recommend using an herbicide all of because like what, what I've said, if especially if it's under your oak trees or under anything you care about, is it could, the herbicides could get absorbed by the roots. Um, the mycelia that connect everything underground and absorbed into your oak trees. Other than that, or maybe you could try raking them up or something, you know, get a fine rake and try raking them up or get some goats again. I think they'll eat your pigs. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I have found pulling them up uh, works fine. Yeah, they're and they're uh, when they're young, when the ground is soft, that should be fairly easy to do. And they, like I said, that one I pulled up and I had the picture of it. It just came right out of the ground. It wasn't a problem. And the ground is even starting to get a little hard. So don't wait until summer to do it. Do it in the spring. Yeah. Uh, pruning seems to eventually kill an oak um, since they grow so slowly. What is the best? aftercare of an oak where the limbs have been removed? Well, you shouldn't really need to do anything. We do not recommend ever covering a cut or even a wound with anything. You know, it used to be you could buy stuff that you slap on the wound and it was supposed to help it heal, but it only holds in disease and moisture. So there's, as long as it's cut properly, Short, should form that kind of a curled in ring around it. And I am not, I'm not an expert on pruning oaks. Um, I just know you want to, if you prune it, number one, you don't want to prune it to the point where the limb, you want to cut it all the way through. You don't want to give it the chance to crack and break off and have a jaggedy stunk, stunk, stump. Sorry, my tongue's not working. Stump because that's going to create some issues in the future probably with disease and rot. But you don't really need to care for the cut. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, so here's a, uh, um, I think I missed a question about serpentine. Uh, somebody asked, uh, what is serpentine soil? Oh, serpentine soil is, another name for that is greenstone. It is pretty common in El Dorado County. It, uh, believe me, it's green. So if you, and nothing much grows there. The plants that grow there, um, it has toxic heavy metals in it that um, most plants can't tolerate. So that's why some of the areas, like if you get a chance to go up to Traverse Creek and look at the CNPS webpage for information on special places, Traverse Creek. Um, you'll find plants that you won't necessarily like the leather oak growing there that can tolerate those heavy metals. 
Next question. Okay. Uh, on my property, Toya, growing right next to my oaks. Uh, um, so, uh, what's the best way to manage that? Cutting them down using Roundup, because uh, the concern is creating a ladder fuel. Right, fuel and that's ladder. a that's a valid concern. Um, and I would try cutting them. Um, you don't want to use Roundup on it, as we've discussed. Um, I would try cutting them out. Are they if they're growing, especially if they're growing right up against the trunk? Now, if they're ten feet away from the trunk, and if you've lifted up the limbs to ten or twelve feet or something on the oak tree, then a smaller toy on, you know, as long as you keep it under control, might not be a real problem but if if they're growing right up against the trunk then probably you should get rid of them yes and i would just cut them out and hope that that you know if you cut them a couple times hopefully it'll kill them uh here's a similar question um uh someone wants to know if there's a good ground cover uh to uh grow around your oaks right and that as i've said is problematic um your best bet i would go to maybe some i'm trying to think we don't run to a lot of ground covers in native plants there's uh mountain misery if you live up in a higher altitude some of you might be familiar with that and that grows underneath oaks um but there's really you know just low growing things that might do well. I've heard that you could use like huckleberry plants underneath oak trees. So, you know, they'll go to three to four feet, I think. Not huckleberry, but a current gooseberry. Uh, you know, I have to admit that I'm not up on what all you should be planting under there. Um, but like, you know, what's so terrible about the oak leaves underneath the oak tree i guess is my question you know is unless it's because you have kids that are playing around there or something and then that is a bit of a problem you could try some of the um uh bunch grasses or things and those you can't really play in those um valerie do you have any suggestions because that one's kind of throwing me i wasn't prepared for that yeah the only thing I think that um, you're right that um, planting anything in the ground underneath an oak tree is um, inviting uh, issues because you're going to have to irrigate and right. um, if you don't irrigate then you're creating a fuel ladder. Um, the one thing that I have heard the master gardeners talk about is um, you can uh, do planters, you know, put something in a pot or a, a half barrel. Um, and then just water that container. Um, so something along that line. Right. But and that really, is really all I have. Yeah, what I mentioned in my earlier, um, you can do that. And if you want to see examples of that, I would go to our uh, Sherwood demonstration garden in Placerville. And we have a shade garden area and we have oak trees. And what we've done is plant things like hosta in wine barrels underneath the oak trees. And that seems to be working out just fine. Yeah, and uh, someone is asking planting daffodils or bulbs. I mean, I think that anything that you don't have to irrigate in the summertime is probably a safe uh, bet. But um, if you right. have to water it, um, or if it's gonna compete uh, with that tree for resources, then you want to give it a second thought. Uh, somebody's also asking about, um, uh, hold on here. Um, uh, sorry, um, the screen scrolls up when people comment. So, oh, so here it is. Out. Yeah, sorry. I try to grab them in advance, but I can't always do that. Um, uh, this was talked about, uh, but maybe you can answer it uh, more specifically. Is bark or rock better around oak trees? I mean, I think you already said no rocks. Yeah, I would stick with bark, um, partly because if you, even if you, you know, small rocks might not be a problem, you know, like 
gravel sized rocks, but then you got to kind of figure out a way to clean it, right? Um, if you rake, it's going to be hard to rake the leaves off of it. So I would, with mulch, it just kind of all soaks in together and it's fine. And so that's what I would stick with really. And buying rock can be pretty expensive on top of that. Um, I, and I just wanted to comment, a couple people were commenting on what they've got growing. Whatever is growing naturally underneath your oaks, of course, is fine, unless it's like poison oak or uh, um, the other thing, toy <laughs> growing too close to the trunk. But someone said they had thrown out poppy seeds. All of those things are fine because they don't need, they get watered in the winter, they bloom for a little while and they die and that is just fine. And I'll also quickly, somebody asked about the tiny worms that hang from the trees. Well, those are some kind, I don't know specifically, they're just one of the many caterpillars that do live in oak trees and sometimes infest them. They're not hurting the tree. So I wouldn't worry about them. That's, uh, that's all the questions we have. That was it? Yes. Um, Okay, well, you know, thank you. And I didn't, you know, I hope you guys learned something from this and I hope I was able for the future to give you a few tools to um, self-educate yourself about your oak trees. And don't forget to visit the Sherwood Demonstration Garden on a Friday or Saturday morning when you get a chance and see what we've done out there. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to leave now.